Hey guys, let's hover in the hip. This is one of those concepts that, at a very high level, it's pretty simple. You just level out the rotor disc, level with the horizon, and then add collective and lift off the ground. Keep your nose pointed straight, and that's all there is to it. What happens is, as you start adding other factors, however, it starts to get a whole lot more complicated. So we're going to talk about some of those, a number of them. I'm going to do my best to simplify them as much as I can so they make some sense. And then we're going to look at hovering with and without the autopilot and give you some tips for how you can hopefully easily get into a relatively stable hover in the hip. Okay, so the first problem is that the rotor disc in the hip is tilted forward about four and a half degrees. You can see that there relative to the horizon. The fix for it's pretty simple. You just pull some aft cyclic here and level out the disc just like this. And that's pretty much all there is to it. But why is it tilted forward to begin with? Well, the answer to that is pretty simple. So in helicopter flight, you accelerate forward by tilting the disc down like this, nose down in the helicopter, and then adding collective. And this will cause the helicopter to nose down and start accelerating. But this doesn't create a very comfortable flight position for the pilots and the passengers who are now leaning nose down. It's just really uncomfortable. And when you've got a, a medium transport like this with 15 people in the back, you really don't want them in that position for an extended period of time. You'd like them to be more comfortable, to be level with the ground. So the way they do that is by tilting the rotor disc forward by default. They actually tilt the whole mast forward in this, I believe, by about four and a half degrees. And that causes um, you not have to nose down the body of the helicopter quite as much to achieve the same forward speed. Now the downside of this is that, as you can see here, during low speed or hovers, the body tends to lean back like this. But that's nowhere near as uncomfortable as the nose down attitude during forward flight. It's quite preferable. So again, just pull some aft cyclic, level out the disc with um, respect to the horizon, and that's pretty much it for that one. Okay, so we solved the first problem of the forward tilted mast with aft cyclic pressure to level out the rotor disc. Great. Now if we were to lift off the ground like that, we would find another problem. The helicopter would start drifting to the left. This is something called translating tendency. So in the hip, the main rotor disc rotates clockwise. So from the top there, it rotates down along the right side and then back up along the left side. The right side is known as the retreating side, the left side is known as the advancing side. This will be more important later, but for now, just keep that in mind. So because of that direction of rotation, What's going to happen is as you add collective and increase the engine torque, that engine torque is going to want to twist the body in the opposite direction. So the blades are rotating clockwise, and, this, and the torque from the engine that makes the blade spin that way will kind of force the body to twist counterclockwise, so the nose will go left. The tail rotor exists primarily to counteract that. So the tail rotor at the back there uh, is constantly trying to pull the tail or in some cases push, depending on how it's mounted. But in this case, it's trying to pull the tail to the left. It's trying to force the body of the helicopter to rotate the same direction as the main rotor disc, the blades. And that's to counteract that torque twist, which is pushing the body in the opposite direction. So again, main rotor disc rotates clockwise. Torque twist causes the body to rotate counterclockwise. Tail rotor counteracts the torque twist and makes the body rotate clockwise. Great, awesome. So that's what allows you to keep the nose pointed straight at different levels of torque at different, uh, different collective settings in helicopter flight. Awesome. But the helicopter causes a little problem. See, just like how the main rotor disc pulls in air from above and pushes it down, which is lift, the tail rotor does the same thing. It's pulling in air from one side and pushing it out the other side. In this case, it's pulling in air from the left and pushing it out to the right, so air is constantly flowing from left to right. And this causes the whole body of the helicopter to drift in the opposite direction, so it's drifting to the left. This is called translating tendency. And we counter that by applying right cyclic until we stop moving. 
So that's the second problem. Are you with me? All right. Now that we've corrected our translating tendency with some right cyclic roll, we've got one final problem we need to talk about for hovering, and that is the magnitude and the direction of the wind. So in low wind conditions, you basically want to hover nose into the wind, and your helicopter is going to do this on its own. It's going to tend towards this, and that's because your helicopter acts a lot like a weather vane. So if you see the big vertical stabilizer at the back there, and let's say the wind is blowing from behind the camera here. It's going to hit that big vertical stabilizer and it's going to push it like this. And it's going to force the tail around until the helicopter is oriented this way. And I've got... Uh, there we go. Okay. Similarly, if it were oriented this way. The wind is going to hit that tail stabilizer and it's going to push it to the right until it can't do that anymore because it's hidden behind the fuselage. So it's just naturally going to do this and behave like a weather vane. And that's something called weather cocking. Now this is great for low wind speeds. But once you get up to about 15 or 16 knots, about 30 kilometers per hour, you run into a couple of problems. So at that speed, you're generating effect, something called effective translational lift, which we'll talk about more in other videos. But for now, what you need to know about that is the wind is blowing across the helicopter body and through the blades fast enough across those horizontal stabilizers on the tail there that it generates more lift than it would and you need less collective, less power to maintain a hover. So when the wind is that strong or when you're moving that fast, you can have reduced collective to stay off the ground, which is great, that's fine. But now what happens if the wind shifts a little bit? or if you yaw a little bit. Well, now you're not in effective, you don't have effective translational lift anymore, and your collective requirements to maintain that hover have just gone up dramatically. If you aren't able to predict which way the wind is going to change and compensate for it quickly, you're gonna drop out of the sky and crash. So you don't wanna be in a situation like that where the collective requirements to maintain your hover are going to change rapidly and dramatically without your control. So hovering nose into the wind above about 30 kilometers per hour or 15 knots is a bad idea. Now you could turn around and hover tail into the wind like this, which will work, but because of that whole weather vane effect that I was talking about before, if you get out of alignment even just a little bit, the wind is gonna grab that tail and whip the helicopter around until it looks like this again. So also not exactly a safe bet. So depending on the helicopter, uh, you're gonna wanna have the wind come in from the flank. So either your left flank like this, or your right flank like this. And which way you want is gonna depend on the main rotation of the main rotor disc, which way it spins. Because that determines which way the tail rotor is moving and well, let's talk about it. So let's say the wind is coming in from this direction. We know that our main rotor blade rotates clockwise, which is this way, right? Our rotors are going around that way. The torque from that movement causes the body to spin back this way, right? And the tail rotor exists to pull the body back around this way so that we can keep our nose pointed where we want it to go. Now, if the wind comes in from this side, it's going to push the tail back this way more, which is the same way that the torque from the main engine and transmission is already causing the body to twist. So it's basically compounding that counterclockwise rotation, and it makes the tail rotor have to work that much harder to pull the tail back around and keep the nose pointed where we want it. And at some point, you're going to run into exceeding the critical angle of attack on the tail rotor, which basically just means that it's going to stop generating lift, it's going to stall, and you're going to lose yaw authority. So this is not a great option for a clockwise rotating helicopter. And if we go and look at this side, so from our right flank, from the retreating side, if the wind comes in this way, it's going to push the tail this way. 
which is the same direction that the tail rotor is already trying to pull the body to counter the torque twist, which is twisting it this way. So the tail rotor is working to counteract that by twisting the body this direction, and the wind is now helping it. So this eases your tail rotor's job to some degree because it's helping you rotate the body in the direction that you need. So in this case, if the wind is too strong to be nose into the wind and you're in a clockwise rotating helicopter, you want the wind to be on your right flank. So you want to turn your nose a bit to the left and have the wind hit you at this kind of angle here. All right, so now that we've talked about wind direction and which way to face the helicopter when we're hovering, Let's talk about how we control the helicopter while we're in a hover so that we don't go crashing down or oscillate and wobble all over the place. So the key is small movements and keeping in mind that for every action there is a reaction and that you need to be one step ahead of the helicopter. You need to compensate for that reaction before it happens. If you are reacting to what the helicopter does, you're too late and you're not going to find yourself in the hover. You have to be able to predict what the, hover, what the helicopter is going to do before it happens and compensate for it. So let's say you lift up off the ground into your hover and you find the helicopter is drifting to the left. So the easy way to correct for that is to add some right cyclic. But if you add too much and you just hold it like this, what's going to happen is now you're going to drift to the right. So you want some lesser amount of cyclic somewhere around here but you don't want to go from drifting to the left to drifting to the right to slowly slowing down and eventually finding that equilibrium what you want to do is counter that drift to the left by going right cyclic and then bring it back but not all the way to where it was because if we bring it back to exactly where it was before we'll go right back to drifting left again so we bump it to the right and then bring it back most of the way. Not all the way, but most of the way. And that motion, I'm exaggerating now, but that motion looks like this. So I go from neutral, right, and then back part way. So that gives it a bit of a bump to the right and then gives it a new neutral position with a little bit more cyclic roll to the right to counter, hopefully counter that drift. And you should find that this would counter that out. Now let's say we are drifting backwards. To counter that out, we're gonna go forwards and then come back most of the way. Not all the way, but most of the way. So again, it's forwards and back. So now our neutral position, if you look at my controls indicator, is gonna be a little bit right and a little bit forward. Now you'll do this to counter whatever movement you see. It's going to be lots of little movements. They'll be, you know, this size, right around whatever your center point is where you're trimmed. And it'll be a push to the side and come back. Push forward, come back. This is the motion you're going to want to use. Okay, so now we have some idea of how we're going to keep ourselves stable in the air with our cyclic inputs. So now we need to talk about our hover altitude. How high do we want to hover? So we can hover really anywhere from about three meters off the ground or above, but different things are gonna happen. So the main thing that we're gonna talk about here is called ground effect. When you're low to the ground, the air that's being pulled in from above the rotor disc and pushed down will collide with the ground. And then from there, it can't continue to go down. It has to be pushed outwards. And so it requires more effort to move this air out of the way as more air is pulled in from above and you almost get a bit of a cushion of air underneath you. It eases the requirements for, uh, for collective and for power to maintain a hover when you're close to the ground because it's got that pocket of air, that sort of cushion of air underneath it that's hard to force out away from you. So when you're hovering above the ground, you don't need as much power when you're just a couple meters above the ground, but because you're kind of sitting on top of this little cushion, it's a little bit like trying to balance on a balloon or a ball, like a beach ball or something. It's a bit tricky. If you get off balance, it rapidly spirals out of control. If we go higher, ground effect gets weaker and weaker and weaker until it goes away entirely. 
and that altitude is determined by the width of the rotor blades. So in the hip, the main rotor disc is 24 meters in diameter, which means that our ground effect can be felt up to an altitude of 24 meters. So above 24 meters, we have zero ground effect whatsoever, and we are hovering entirely under our own power, and it will require the same power, more or less, depending on uh, air density, from that altitude above. We won't be getting any uh, assistance from ground effect above that. So I tend to hover at three different altitudes. So three meters, the very basic low ground effect, just to see if you can get off the ground. You do your hover checks there. Then I'll typically hover in the 15 to 20 meter range where I have minimal ground effect and I'm up off the ground, but I still have some. And then again at around 40 meters where I'm well out of ground effect and in my own power. All right, so next we talk about how we get off the ground. And we do that in two steps. The first step is called light on wheels. This is where we add just enough collective that the main rotor disc is carrying most of the weight of the helicopter. And while the wheels are still on the ground, they're not really bearing the weight of the helicopter. They're just sort of providing a contact patch with the ground grip. And that's it. We want to get to that point and try to make sure that we're in equilibrium, that we're not sliding around or drifting or rolling or anything else, so that when we lift off the ground, we have the best chance possible of already being in a reasonable hover with minimal amounts of drift. This is also gonna help us avoid something called dynamic rollover, which we may or may not see in a minute. So if you have a look at the strut or the damper for the rear wheels, shock I guess it's uh it's fairly compressed and if I add some collective it extends if I add more collective it extends further and eventually it gets to a point where it's at its maximum extension before the wheels will start to come off the ground and right before that point right before the wheel comes off the ground that's light on wheels that's what we want that's our target state where even though our brake is on we can slide around on the wheels and it's pretty hard to find it exactly but with a little bit of practice and a little bit of patience you will and then we take our time from there to adjust things now my brake is on right now and if I let go like I look pretty stable here but if I were to lift off the ground watch kind of what happens I go up and one wheels coming up and the other one is not and if I continued that for even a moment longer, I would have rolled over. And that's dynamic rollover. So that's a case where the helicopter wants to roll one direction, it wants to drift, but it can't because the wheels are preventing it. But as soon as those wheels come up, as soon as one of the wheels comes up, it can now pivot on the other wheel and roll over because it can apply that drift. So that's what we want to avoid. Uh, as much as possible while we're in the light on wheels phase. We want to find any indication that this might happen and cancel it out and uh, compensate for it before we lift off the ground. So let's try this again. Get ourselves light on wheels. Not to the point where the wheel comes off the ground. And then let's take our brake off and see what happens. So if I let go of the brake, now I'm rolling brake back on and I look stable again so when you're learning how to do this I highly recommend you take your brake off because it will give you much better indication of what movements the helicopter wants to do and is going to do when you add a little bit more collective so if I let go of the brake and I pull some aft cyclic now and I know that we're gonna roll over so I want some right cyclic so I don't roll over to the left now if I add a little bit more collective again, now my brake is still off and I'm not moving and this looks a whole lot better. And I can add more power and now see so that wheel wants to come off again so I add more right cyclic. Try to even that out. And at some point you'll be happy with where you are and when you add enough cyclic, or add enough collective, I should say, 
you won't be moving, and here's our target state. This is what we want. We are so light on our wheels that we can slide any direction on them. And any more collective will cause us to lift off the ground. If we can get into a stable state here, where we're not drifting and rolling and sliding like I'm kind of doing now, then we're ready to lift off the ground. So take your time. This is going to take a while. Once you find that equilibrium, trim so that you don't have to hold it the whole time. Okay, it's time to use everything we know and hover. So for this, I have the autopilot off, as you can see down here. I really recommend that you learn to hover without the autopilot initially. You'll get a much better feel for what's involved, for how it works. And then later when you turn the autopilot on, you'll have a better understanding of what it's doing for you and how to use it most effectively. So give it a try. It will be painful. You will crash. You will wobble all over the place. You will hate it. But learn it. It will be worth it, and you will feel much better having done it. So give it a shot, and let's go through it. So we need some aft cyclic because we have a forward tilted rotor disc. We know that we have translating tendency to the left, so we need some right cyclic. We know that we want to turn our brake off and use our anti-torque pedals to steer our nose into the wind, or in this case, down the runway. Brake is off, left anti-torque to keep the nose held. And we know that we want to raise enough collective that we are light on the wheels, where the wheels are not supporting the weight of the helicopter, the rotor disc is, but we're still on the ground where we can safely make some adjustments to our trim. So we get ourselves to that point where we are now drifting around a little, try to compensate for that, slowly adding collective. We don't want to lift off the ground, we just want to be floaty on the ground. Now optionally here, once you're happy with your positioning light on wheels, you can trim your helicopter. And then we're just going to add a small amount of collective to lift up off the ground. You're also going to need a little bit of right anti-torque pedal as you add collective. Keep the nose pointed straight. And then we're just going to correct whatever drift we happen to see when we get up there. So we're going to start with just hovering a few meters off the ground. Add a little bit of collective, a little bit of right anti-torque, and up we go. So I was drifting a bit to the right, which is okay. Correct with a little bit less right cyclic roll. Try to keep the nose pointed into the wind. And then try to see if you are hovering. There's a few different ways that we can do that. So if I just pause the game right here. First way is this indicator right here. This is our Doppler hover indicator. And I'm actually too low right now. You can see the off light is lit up, which means I need to climb a little bit higher before this will kick in. But what it'll show us is if we're moving in any direction, those black bars will start to fill up with white lines and it'll show us which direction we're moving in. If it looks the way it does now, it means we're not moving, we're hovering, and that's what we want. If we look down here, this is our VVI, or Vertical Velocity Indicator. It tells us our ascent or descent rate. We want it to be right on zero, it means we're not climbing or descending, and that we're in hover. And we can look at something like our canopy frame here in reference to the ground to see if we're moving around. Now, a lot of pilots will tend to pick a reference point on the ground way out there at the horizon. This isn't going to work. It's too far away. It's not going to give you a good indication of small movements. You want to pick something 10 to 15 meters away. So I tend to use my canopy frame, or maybe you want to use your mirror and the wipers up here and create some kind of a sight picture with those two things. Whatever you want to do, just pick something fairly close to the helicopter and use that as your visual reference point. So if I unpause again, 
All right, so to set back down, actually let's go up a little bit higher first. So to go up higher, we're gonna add more collective and more right anti-torque pedal to keep our nose pointed. We're going up to 10 meters here or so. And now our Doppler uh, hover indicator is active. You can see that down there. It's gonna tell us if we're moving around significantly in any direction, which so far so good. And then we're gonna go up to 40 meters and get ourselves well out of ground effect. So more collective, more right anti-torque. And then we climb up to somewhere around here. Reduce our collective to level off. And exactly the same thing. Now, as you get higher, you don't have the same visual reference points close by. And you'll notice that even using the canopy frame, gets a little harder to use as a reference. So now you're gonna to wanna to use your Doppler indicator. And if I pause, I'm actually gonna pick up a little bit of speed here and show you what that looks like. If I start going backwards and pause, the Doppler indicator has that white line extending out from the bottom telling me that I'm going backwards. So this becomes a really useful thing to have and it's off because I'm tilted too far but when you don't have a good visual reference point, that can be really useful to tell you. So there we go. Now it's telling me that I'm moving backwards quite quickly. And a little bit to the right. That can be really useful to tell you whether you're in a stable hover. You can also look at your VVI, which you know now tells me that I'm descending. And the combination of those instruments and the visual reference point will help you get into a hover. So I actually find it more challenging up here because I don't have the nice close visual reference points. But with a little bit of practice, you can be fairly stable in a hover at any altitude. So here I'm high enough, I'm at 65 meters, that I'm well out of ground effect. And now to descend, I'm just gonna reduce my collective a bit. And I wanna watch my vertical velocity indicator. Depending on how heavy you are coming down from a vertical hover like this, you don't wanna go down any lower than two meters per second. If you can keep it at one, that's even better. I'm nice and light right now, so I don't have to worry too much. I can come down pretty safely at two meters per second, or even three. I'm gonna aim for two. And then this power setting, it's letting me descend now. I'm gonna stop descending without touching my collective at around three to five meters, where ground effect is at its strongest. So without touching my collective, I get close to the ground, and then because the rotors have to work so much harder to force air down and then away, I end up on this almost cushion of air here in ground effect, and I can hover again here just a few meters off the ground. To set down, I can reduce my collective a little bit more. So I actually entered two different levels of ground effect. The first one was up at 10 meters, this one now down at three. So you can see that as you get lower to the ground, ground effect gets stronger. You need less and less power to maintain a hover at these altitudes. And then once I'm ready, reduce collective again, and we're down. brake on. Now we're going to do that one more time, this time with the autopilot on. I'll go into more detail about the autopilot in a separate video. But for now, we're just going to turn on the attitude hold and the yaw hold. And then we're going to look at how, look at how much more stable I am lifting off the ground and how much easier it is to maintain that hover and how, how few movements I need but I find that the autopilot is only this beneficial when you understand what it's doing for you and when you have a grasp of how to hover without it.
So again, the same idea applies here. Let's add our aft cyclic and our right cyclic. Now this time, because the autopilot is on, we don't have to touch the anti-torque pedals. We just leave them alone and the autopilot will handle it for us. We go light on wheels. We adjust for any rolling around that we're doing. And then once we are happy with our light on wheels balance, up we go. And I'm not going to touch the pedals at all. Just going to correct for drift with my cyclic. And the thing you'll notice already is that my nose is kind of locked right down the runway. It's not moving at all. The autopilot is handling that for me. So I can get into a stable hover with smaller and fewer movements the autopilot is correcting for a lot of the oscillations for me. And then I can add more collective and I don't have to touch the pedals. The autopilot will again handle that for me. I just correct for drift. Go up to 10 meters. Now once you get a little bit more power, the autopilot has a limit of how much anti-torque it can apply for you. And you may get some left yaw, and you may have to take over for it, depending on conditions. But if we go way up here to 60 meters, again, the yaw hold is holding the nose right down the runway, and all I have to do is correct for drift. So I can look at things like my vertical velocity indicator to see if I'm climbing or descending, and the Doppler hover indicator to see if I'm drifting. I can also use the altitude hold on the autopilot and then take my hand off the collective entirely and then just use my cyclic to maintain my drift. So a whole lot more stable, much easier to get in and out of, but I firmly believe you need to have a grasp of how to hover without the autopilot before it will really be beneficial to you. And again, to descend, we just reduce our collective a bit. Watch our descent rate. We're a bit high here. Add some collective before we get into VRS. Come down at one meter per second here. We enter another hover at 10 meters. Reduce power again. Enter another hover around three. And then reduce our collective one more time to touch down. All right, that's it. That is hovering in the hip. It is akin to air-to-air -air refueling in a jet. It is likely the most difficult thing you'll do. It's fiddly. It's best accomplished with small movements when you're relaxed. If you tense up, you're gonna make larger movements. You're gonna oscillate and wobble around, much like if you look at the basket when you're refueling. It's just gonna take time, but it's important to learn. It's one of the best feelings when you do learn it and it will help make other aspects of flight in the helicopter that much easier so i hope this helped i hope it made sense uh, if i missed something or got something wrong please let me know and i'll see you guys next time